How to See a Man About a Dog. It combines darkly comic short stories, powerful poems, and pulp fiction prose to create a heartbreaking and hilarious journey readers will not soon forget. Read How to See a Man About a Dog, Collected Writings, for free with Kindle Unlimited. Ebook available on Kindle, print copies available on Amazon, the Book Depository, and more. Broadcasting across the nation, from the East Coast to the West, keeping you up to date on technology while enjoying a little whiskey on the side. With leading edge topics, along with special guests, to navigate technology in a segmented, stylized radio program. The information that will make you go, hmm. Pull up a seat, raise a glass with our hosts as we spend the next hour talking about technology for the common person. Welcome to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. Welcome to Tech Time with Nathan Mum, the show that makes you go, hmm, mm. technology news of the week, the show for the common everyday person talking about technology, broadcasting across the nation with insightful segments on subjects weeks ahead of the mainstream media. We welcome our radio audience of 35 million listeners to an hour of insightful technology with a little whiskey on the side. I'm Nathan Mum. Welcome to our show today. We live streamed here on our show on five of the most popular platforms, including YouTube, Twitch.tv, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We encourage you to watch us live or visit us at TechTimeRadio.com, or you can even tweet us live during the show at hashtag TechTimeRadio, and we'll do our best to respond to your question on the air. I'm your host, a technologist with 30 years of expertise, working for companies like Microsoft and Vulcan Inc., a keynote speaker on technology subjects from cybersecurity to blockchain and everything in between. My co-host, Mike Corday, is an award-winning author, Originally from Arizona, he has a human behavior expert living in the Seattle area with a master's degree in forensic psychology. His 20-plus year career helping others understand human behavior to make better decisions. Mike keeps me from geeking out while providing an insight into human behavior and how it interacts with technology. We're two friends that come from different backgrounds but bring the best technology show possible every week for our family, friends, and fans to enjoy. Welcome, everybody. Mr. Gurday, it's nice to see you back in the studio. Yeah, I'm yeah. back. A couple of, a couple of vacation weeks. How was that? Uh, great. Great? Did you get a little bit of sun? I got a lot of sun. All right. Well, welcome back. Okay. Yeah, you can't get that up here. You can't get that up here. That's right. We get it. Oh, you can get it from July 4th to July 7th. Yeah, well, we'll see. This is this is unusual. I, I understand this is very unusual that weather that we're having. Uh, no, that's what everybody tells you when you're out of state. and they just Is, that what, is yeah. that what happens? Yeah, that's, just, that's just the... Pacific Northwest lie. This is it's, it's all known. It's all known. When you got you're born with that type of lie in your back pocket. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. I get it. Uh, okay. I, I want to go back to my pool. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Well, I'm glad you're here today. It should be exciting. Welcome everybody. Odie, I'm glad to see you. Now let's get ready to start today's show. Now on today's show. What are we talking again about? All right, we have Nick Espinosa joining us from Security Fanatics to talk about the top issues in security happening in Russia and Ukraine, along with a few cybersecurity issues that happened this week and, and something that happened a couple months ago, but it's breaking news on how some criminals are working with criminals. It's very interesting. We're going to be talking about that. Um, somebody wants to buy Twitter. We're gonna, that's our lead story to start. I'm not going to get into it, but somebody else now wants to buy Twitter. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, what happens when a ransomware gang threatens to take over a government? Going on in Costa Rica, we're going to be talking about that story. What's happening to Bitcoin? And we have Phil Hennessy, who's going to join the show to start a four-part series called Phil's Electric versus Gas Vehicle Technology Insights. Yeah. So a four-part series will be very interesting to, to see. Does an electric versus gas vehicle versus hybrid, because there's kind of the hybrids, What's the best out there? What's What do they do? We're going to go and explain that into a four-part series. Excited about that, too. And then, of course, we have this week in technology, Mike's mesmerizing moment, and our pick of the day, whiskey tasting. So sit back, raise a glass, and welcome to Tech Time with Nathan Mum. Now it's time to start our show with our loaded question of the week, brought to you by Elderberry Boost. Get your Elderberry Boost today at elderberry-boost.com. Mike and Odie, here is your loaded question. Are you a cat person or a dog person? Really, it's a okay. high, 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 high psychology uh, question. Yeah, that that is okay. Yeah, if if I if I had to choose to have a pet, yeah, it would be a cat. A cat? Yeah. Okay. Low maintenance. Low maintenance. I got you. Okay, Odie. I'm a dog person, but I'm I'd like to have a cat. You like to have a cat? Mm-hmm. So we're cat people. Let me just tell you, cats. Although I don't know if I'm a cat person when my cat scratches the side of my. Well, you live out in the. 
boondocks. They do. And, and I do have one cat that goes and brings back a present only every other day, a little mm-hmm. mole or a little bit of a, a mice or a little bit of a rat. So, you know, that's okay. All right. So, okay. There okay, we go. Well, thanks there you for go. that. There you go. I'm a cat person. There, there you, you go. go. That was brought to you again by Elderberry Boost. You can visit elderberry-boost.com. I feel very enlightened question. right now. You feel very what? I feel very enlightened right now. Okay, there you go with that question. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, that was a very enlightening question. That was deep. All right. <laughs> okay, now it's time to get the latest headlines in the world of technology. <clears throat> What's happening in the world of technology? This is our top stories in the first five minutes. All right, here's story number one, our lead story, <laughs> Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Wants to buy Twitter, and he has big plans to revamp the platform. Now, yeah, all right. Elon Musk is having a little bit of time kind of coming up with the trouble. money. Yeah, yeah, he's the, having some trouble with it. Well, you know. Well, he's saying that it's because there's bots out there, and he just wants to know how many active users. Really, it's a financial deal where I don't think he has enough money. You, you think? Uh, yeah. yeah. He doesn't have enough money to back it right now. So, so lo and behold. So Snoop Dogg wants to come in. That's <laughs> right. The hit-making rapper Snoop Dogg has been in the music industry for three decades uh, his big hit, Drop It Like It's Hot, is interested in purchasing Twitter and reworking the platform. So what, what does Snoop Dogg want to do that Elon does? <laughs> well, what, tell me that. Well, Snoop Dogg took to Twitter to outline his plan to buy the company. So he's using Twitter to explain this. <laughs> uh, he, he's tweeted, may have to buy Twitter now, Snoop said. Going to replace the board of directors with Jimmy from my corner fish fry, Tommy Chong, <laughs> and the guy with the ponytail on CNBC. Oh. Okay, so that's so that's the first thing he's going to do. Yeah, first line of business uh, is to have fee internet on. I think it's supposed to be free, but free internet, free internet on, on airplanes. Twenty nine dollars for one hour is BS. I don't know how that has anything to do with Twitter, but <laughs> uh, thanks, Snoop. That's he just you know when he's going to buy Twitter, he's going to Twitter is all of a sudden going to become an internet company that's going to uh, VSAT. And I understand shoot up. that because I just just flew, okay. you know, and it was nineteen bucks for an hour of internet yeah i'm like no i just i just relax and i I, that's like the one time i can unplug now also snoop says everybody gets a blue check mark even the bots with 10 letters in their names that you hit in a dm and it just says hello back to you and he says nah f those bots he had it ending with a hashtag when snoop buys twitter now elon musk decided to join in on this yeah so he decided to actually tweet back to snoop with two fire emojis so I don't. What, is that, know. what does that mean? Is he going to burn down Snoop or burn down Twitter? I, 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 you know what? I, I don't. Snoop Dogg responded, "You bring the fire, I'll bring the smoke." And he had a picture of his emoji with yeah. the fire, and he had a, a little vaping. Uh, yeah, we icon. we know what kind of smoke that is. <laughs> if Snoop Dogg did buy Twitter, it'd be the. It would not be his first venture into the world of technology by any means. He has ventured into the video game business, creating his own esports league known as Gangsta Gaming League. Yeah. Now, have, I, actually, I have watched Snoop Dogg play Madden football. He was on like the celebrity Madden football deal, and it's very surprising. He is very, very good at Madden football. As a superstar that plays, he plays at a very high level. So you know what? If he can, so he play, spends a lot of time playing video games. He may be and smoking, and smoking a little bit on the side. Some stuff. All right, there you go. All right, so there right. you go. I think this. I think this next story is a little more serious than okay. Snoop Dogg buying Twitter. Well, I don't know. Snoop is be very serious. Okay, you're up. <laughs> So a, a ransomware gang Ooh. that has infiltrated some of Costa Rican government computers has upped this threat by saying that it's going to overthrow the government now. So a cybersecurity or no, a cyber. A cyber ransomware group. Okay. Um, perhaps seizing on the fact that President Rodrigo Chavez has only been in office for a week. Uh, Monday, a news conference that the attack was coming from inside as well as outside of Costa Rica. So, um so they're they're having a cyber attack yeah, on Costa Rica's primary, primary stuff. Yeah, Chavez says that uh, his officials were battling a national terrorist group that had collaborators inside Costa Rica. Okay. He also said, said the impact was broader than previously known, with 27 government institutions, including municipalities and state-run utilities, affected. He blamed his pre- predecessor, Carlos Alvarado, for not investing in cybersecurity and for not more aggressively dealing with the attacks in the waning days of his term as president. Okay. Uh, Chavez declared a state of emergency over the attack as soon as he was sworn in. Last week, the U.S. State Department has offered a $10 million reward for information leading to the identification 
or location of these leaders, who is in a group called Conti. Conti responded by writing, we are determined to overthrow the government by means of a cyber attack. We have already shown you all the strength and power you have introduced an emergency. I don't know what that means, but. So that's a response. So, you know, we're going to have to ask Nick Espinoza about well, that. We, yeah, cyber games that was, are now. Yeah, we talked about. Well, you talked about that in the newsletter about yep. whether or not the U.S. should be offering bounties Rewards. for people outside of the country who are doing cyber attacks. Yeah, that. and I and kind of have a mixed feeling about that, right? I mean, we don't want to be just trying to attack everybody, the United well, States government, putting these bounties up if they find information. I don't know about that. I'm, I'm kind of a little torn on that. So. Okay, well, that's what's going on in Costa Rica right now. All right, well, let me talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin plunges. What happened to Bitcoin? And it explodes us that cryptocurrency could be volatile. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Did nobody know that? <laughs> if you haven't listened to our show for the last two plus years, we should have, we've at least said this at least a hundred times. Mm-hmm. The cryptocurrency, as Elon Musk likes to call it. It's a hustle. It's a side hustle, right? It's a side hustle. So essentially, the sell-off of crypt- cryptocurrency resumed Monday as Bitcoin dipped to a low of 25K. On Thursday last week, the total market value of cryptocurrencies has dropped about $326 billion. So you understand, in the cryptocurrency market, over the last month, it has dropped down $326 billion fake dollars that don't really exist. Right. All right. In the past seven days, though, roughly $1.33 trillion have been lost. Still not too bad for that good old side hustle, as Elon Musk said, that... It's just a side hustle. So be careful with your cryptocurrency. Anybody out there investing in cryptocurrency, it is a it is a non banked backed currency. So do we do we know what has caused Well this? the whole market's down, right? And I'm not a market expert, but I did look at my four oh one K and it went from a, a lot to kind of in half. So I think it's just the whole market it's in the general. Whole market in general. And, and when you have fake currency as cryptocurrency, well, it's, it's probably all, affected. You know, it's all affected by human emotion, so it is, right? Isn't that, that's... Yeah. It's it's really interesting. So you know, we talked about that on the way in the, on the show, about kind of how many jobs are available in the market, but yet people can't find jobs, but yet right. people aren't getting jobs. So, yeah. All right. Well, Mike, our time is up. We got through the top stories of the week. If you want to learn more about this, please visit us online at techtimeradio.com and click on the episodes section or blog to get even more details on these stories and features. Now it's time to get ready for our whiskey tasting during the break. But up next, we have Nick Espinoza, with our Technology Insider. We also have Phil Hennessy joining the show later, and we're going to be back in a moment with our Technology Insider. You're listening to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. Hey, Mike. What? Have you heard of Elderberry? Only in reference to a Monty Python movie. Well, let me tell you, Elderberry Boost. Again, that's elderberry-boost.com. Elderberry Boost. Yes, Mike, that's Elderberry Boost. You can choose Organic Elderberry Boost, that 8-ounce size. It's available on sale right now at eleven ninety nine. But you're listening here right now on Tech Time Radio, so you need to go to Elderberry, that's E-L-D-E-R-B-E-R-R-Y-Boost.com and get some today. Elderberry Boost. Elderberry is an all-natural organic immune system booster and antiviral. Elderberry is known to actively fight against viruses, including colds and the flu. It also works as a natural remedy for allergies, cancer, digestion, heart disease, high cholesterol, headache, toothache, weight loss, and reduced inflammation. It's a natural and healthy diuretic and has many antiviral properties. While it is famous for fighting the flu, it is effective for any illness. Elderberry Boost was created to provide a quality organic elderberry to their customers. After searching years ago for a perfect elderberry syrup, none could be found, so they essentially created their own homemade recipe. If you would like to get 15% off your first order of Elderberry Boost, just put in the discount code TECHTIME at checkout. Again, that's elderberry-boost.com. Elderberry Boost. Hey, Mike. Yeah, what's up? Hey, what would you recommend for someone that's looking to launch their career in coding? Treehouse, man. Treehouse has one of the best and most affordable online classrooms for you. At Treehouse, they've rethought the learning process and built a proven system to get you the skills and knowledge you need to achieve your goals. That's awesome. When you're done with a course, you haven't just watched a video. You've learned, practiced, and absorbed the concept or choose to build your portfolio create a network and land your dream job with their boot camp style tech degree program land a dev job this year okay whatever your goal we'll get you there get 50 percent off your first month as a podcast listener it's teamtreehouse.com 
forward slash sign up underscore code. That's sign up underscore code forward slash podcorn courses. Sign up today with our special tech time radio code. Now listen carefully. It's teamtreehouse.com forward slash sign up underscore code. That's sign up underscore code forward slash podcorn courses. That's awesome. Sign up today. Uh, welcome back to Tech Time with Nathan Mum. Tech Time is a weekly technology show that talks about current technology in a simple format without having to geek out. Brought to you by myself, Nathan Mum, and Mike Roday. We just had our first whiskey tasting during the break. And now, let me tell you about what we are sipping in our pick of the day. Today, we have sh- chosen the Elijah Craig Toasted Barrel Bourbon. 94 proof, $55. It's a mash bill, 78% corn. 12% rye, 10% malted barley. Um, it's no age statement, but approximately 10 to 12 years, plus the finishing time in a second barrel. This year we're tasting is a 2020, uh, 94 proof. It has a little bit of the caramel butter and a little bit of black pepper, a hint of cocoa. What do you think of this so far, Mr. Gorday? So far, so smooth. All right. Well, Mark gave us a little bit of information on this, on, mm-hmm. on, on the background. So first brought to market... In 1986, the long-running Elijah Craig small batch bourbon provides the base for toasted barrels finish. The process begins with a full matured small batch, which is dumped and then re-entered at barrel proof into a second custom toasted new oak barrel designed in partnership with the independent Stave Company. Made in an 18-month air-dried oak, the finished barrel is first toasted and then flash charred using a moderate toast temperature and toast time. An extensive research and development process resulted in a final barrel toast profile, bringing the forward dark sugar flavors within the wood to create a balance of smokiness and sweetness after months of finishing. Mm-hmm. All right. You okay. That? I got it. There you go. Okay. Well, as we do move on next, we have Nick Espinoza. He works as a chief security at Chief Security Fanatic. He's a CIO, speaker, columnist, author, radio host, board member, Forbes Tech Council, and a TEDx speaker. But we call him our Tech Time cybersecurity expert. Let's start this out. Welcome to Technology Insider. We get the information directly from the source. All right. Ransomware groups get by with a little help from their cyber crime friends. Well, calling them friends might be pushing things a bit, but ransomware Uh, Criminal syndicates regularly communicate and collaborate, learning from each other's approaches and sometimes even outright stealing or borrowing each other's work. No way. Yeah. The extent of such activity has been highlighted by the leak of Conti's internal communication on February 27. Nick, can you explain what this leak is and what did we learn? Hi, Nick. Good. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Absolutely. All right. Right on. So, yeah. So this this is actually really an interesting one. Basically, uh, essentially, the cybersecurity world is calling this the Panama Papers of ransomware, given the insight that we basically learned about the Conti ransomware gang. This is the closest thing to reality TV for a cybersecurity nerd, quite frankly. So this is really interesting. But first, a quick backdrop here. Very early on in the Russian-Ukrainian war, crisis, invasion, whatever you want to call it, Conti, who is predominantly Russian-based, basically made a public statement where they actually expressed loyalty to the Russian administration. Basically, they're all for Putin and all of that, and I'll get to that in a second. Now, basically, as a reaction to this, a Ukrainian security researcher operating under the twiddle hander at Conti Leaks decided to publish years of basically their internal communications, and they were using a platform called Jabber to do that. Now, these chats, basically, that they have, are, are they're span they span like several years thousands of messages and all of that but interestingly enough this was not the first time that Conti had been hit last summer one of their disgruntled affiliates posted their attack playbook online which was just amazing uh, useful intelligence for for the cybersecurity community on how Conti was approaching and attacking companies and how we could defend them now since that was public, 
essentially everybody jumped on this to review the chats and everything. And so we started seeing basically disclosures within the first few hours popping up from cybersecurity researchers on Twitter. And so here's the basics of what we understand. First things first is we got a better understanding of how, they, how they're basically set up and how they actually execute their attack infrastructure. They're using platforms like, uh, or malware like TrickBot and platforms like Cobalt Strike, which are pretty hard to identify for antivirus. And then obviously they're adding their own level of sophistication with their own customized programming. And so the, they're very difficult once they're in to detect as the government of Costa Rica is now finding out. Now, the other side of the coin here is just how sophisticated their operation was. They were literally running like a corporation. They have an office building, according to these chats, human resources. They've got other departments that are specific to the various aspects of cybersecurity. They were even doing regular salaries on the 15th and the 30th of each month and were keeping <laughs> clock regular business hours from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Moscow time. Wow. They apparently have 100 people on their payroll. They were even tracking vacation and sick days on top of this. Probably PTO but, on top of that too, right? Yeah. yeah, totally. yeah. You don't want to take too much PTO off, right? Oh, yeah. my God. It's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. They're more polished than many small businesses I've walked into. Now, on top of that, the cool part about this too is that we got a glimpse of, I, I don't know if it's cool, but it's interesting, of just how closely tied with Russian intelligence Conti is. Now, the boss of Conti, according to these chats, is an individual known as Stern. And according to basically chats with one of the coders or testers named Angelo, Stern is closely affiliated with the Russian FSB. That's their intelligence wing and works for, quote unquote, PU, which many believe is Putin, meaning they had deep ties into the Russian government. So if you think Russia isn't hacking everyone through cutouts and all of that kind of stuff, we now have direct evidence of internal communications from the cutout themselves. And so I think that's just very interesting. And we also, um, to your point that you made earlier, was that they are now, we, we now see how they're collaborating, not just with potentially Russian intelligence, but also with other ransomware gangs and other affiliates. And so there is basically, the chat show that Conti and Ryuk were working together. Uh, that's another ransomware gang, the Maze ransomware gang, Netwalker, which was closed down um, due to basically uh, foreign intelligence hitting them and shutting them down. Conti and Lockbit. Lockbit is another one of the most prolific gangs out there and a slew of others. And this really underscores just how massive and well-coordinated these gangs in Eastern Europe, primarily Russia, are working with each other as well as Russian intelligence. So obviously it's a it's a huge win for, for cybersecurity researchers. And like I said, grab the popcorn because this is as close to reality TV as we get in our industry. It's pretty All cool. right, so we have the war with Russia and Ukraine ongoing, right? So yeah. I, again, the cyber attacks have kind of been less to the United States, specifically from Russia, because they're they're pretty they're busy. Occu they're they're busy and occupied. Let, let's get an update. What's going on in Russia and Ukraine on the cyber attacks on both sides of this? So you can start with Russia first or Ukraine first. What's the latest in the war? Sure, sure. So what we know right now is that Russia, you know, as you just uh, touched on, sorely underestimated the global cyber unity that we've seen and they've all been hitting. So while we've been, or I should say, while Russia's been launching cyber attacks against Ukraine and Ukrainian-based organizations worldwide, Intel suggests they've been having such a hard time keeping up now with the attacks being launched against Russian infrastructure that a good portion of their cyber capability is now focused on defense. So they don't have essentially the robustness that we thought they did, and, and they are spending a lot of time and energy just defending against these hacks. Now, some of the recent hits that we've seen that, you know, quite frankly, put a smile on my face is one is a logistics supply chain for alcohol distribution was hit hard, which means shortages on things like vodka. You want to separate the Russian population from their vodka supply. People are working on that right now. Obviously, that is designed to anger the Russian population. Also, the state like TV guide channel, you know, that like one channel that you get with like your cable TV that shows you like everything that's playing that, you know, like that period or for the yep. next couple of hours yep. that got hit. And basically it was they replaced all the show names with pro-Ukrainian slogans as well as Ukrainian information. So anybody in Russia with a television that was looking, let's say, at what do I want to watch tonight and flip into that channel started to see pro-Ukrainian uh, slogans and information on top of that. 
one of the Russian major news sites was hit by two Russian nationals who we believe actually live outside the borders. Obviously, they're afraid for their lives now, but they got in so deep that they changed all of the articles and all of the headlines to anti-Putin, anti-war, everything, complete with fully written articles on how Russia is a bad actor you know, in this situation, all those kinds of things. And so basically, while infrastructure attacks are still constantly being launched against the Kremlin, against military infrastructure and all of those things, much of the coordination at the moment basically between attacking groups and cutouts for allied intelligence, if you will, and the Ukrainian government have been focused on psychological warfare, especially since Kyiv is now safe enough to have the U.S. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and the Senate Minority Leader, Mitch McConnell, swing by for a visit. And so the nice part about this right now is that the Ukrainian government has essentially been stabilizing a lot of the areas when we all thought Kyiv was going to fall in a week. And so we've been able to focus on the psychological side of this to turn the Russian population essentially against uh, Putin and the Russian government for, for launching this war. Perfect. Perfect. So there's all this uh, stuff that's going on with their de- having to defend against all these hackers. Is You think that may be why they're suddenly coming into the Costa Rican place and saying, we're going to overthrow your government because they, they're just trying to get their money. Well, well I, I, go, go and answer that, Nick. I have my yeah, thoughts. So here. I, I think, I think this is actually really interesting. And it's something that I think Nate, Nathan touched on earlier is that now that we have direct evidence, thanks to the Conti leak, that Conti is deeply in bed with the Russian FSB, meaning the leader of that, this individual named Stern, there could be a case, a case could be made in international law that Russia is now attacking through a cutout another foreign government. Correct. And so that I think is something that that we have to be concerned about. And it's something that, uh, you know, I think may be adjudicated in international law through The Hague or, or, you know, another one of those governing bodies. But yes, I mean, to that point, I don't necessarily think Conti needs the payday above and beyond. They hit multiple corporations, multiple entities. They're making tens of millions of dollars every single year hitting these organizations. So why the fixation on a government and shutting it down when that is typically outside their playbook? It smacks of intelligence work from a foreign country. So here we are. We're going to see where that goes. All right. Let's not let's let's not leave North Korea out of this. All right. Oh, no. My next question. United States has sanctioned virtual currency mixer Blender.io for its role in enabling North Korea to conduct malicious cyber activities and money laundering and stolen virtual currency. This is the first instance of the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Asset Control imposing sanctions on a digital asset mixing service. Explain to us, what is a digital asset mixing service, Nick? Yeah. So if you're looking at essentially a a cryptocurrency, uh, you know, take your pick on cryptocurrency. What you're trying to do, especially if you're laundering it, is essentially obfuscating its trail by moving it through various currency exchanges, uh, by swapping it out for one cryptocurrency type or another, like moving Bitcoin to Ethereum or Ethereum to Bitcoin. This is why a lot of attackers use Monero right now, but the goal is to obfuscate the trail. Now, the upside to this right now, especially uh, we saw that recent case, I cannot remember their two names, of that 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 couple, this married couple that basically stole about three, four billion dollars worth of cryptocurrency from Binance a few years ago. We are seeing law enforcement internationally so basically stepping up the game in terms of tracking these things to the point where they're starting to see these fraudulent transactions hop from one blockchain to another. And so when you're looking at something like um, Blender and North Korea, essentially the charge here, from what I understand, is simply that that um, Blender does not or, or, or rather rather was turning a blind eye to the machinations of what Korea was North Korea was doing. North Korea has been shifting their focus internally from intelligence based attacks, meaning stealing intellectual property or government secrets to purely money-making operations, hitting the Bank of Sri Lanka, for example, and stealing something like $800 million because, quite frankly, they need the money. And now that they've got this massive, massive coronavirus hit, uh, something like 1.3 million North Koreans are now infected and they don't have viruses or any infrastructure, this becomes even more of a concern for North Korea's intelligence operations because, quite frankly, they need to be laundering money. They need to be you know, basically going through these steps in order to fund survival at this point. All right. So let's talk just real quick. And then, and then we're going to have to end our segment. Cryptocurrency. This is one thing that I always get from people where they always think that if I am transferring cryptocurrency from like one exchange to another, that it's always uh, hidden 
that it's anonymous, that nobody knows when these transactions happen. Explain to the common listener, Nick, a little bit here. How is it that cryptocurrency kind of transfers from exchange to exchange? But can you explain to it where it's not really hidden and there's information and markers that is being done with these transfers? Sure, sure. Well, like think think about a regular bank, you know, so if I'm going to Chase Bank and I'm moving money from Chase Bank to U.S. Bank, I'm essentially issuing an order to Chase to say, hey, move all my money or an X amount of money from your bank to this bank. And essentially they sync up on the back end, create a transaction log that says, OK, I'm moving this from Nick Espinosa's account here in Chase to Nick's account here, uh, you know, at U.S. Bank. And so now there's a paper trail, meaning if I go to the IRS and say, I don't know what happened to that $100,000, the IRS can investigate to say, well, it's clearly obvious you move this from Chase to U.S. Bank. Now, in the dawn of cryptocurrency, these exchanges and, you know, as we've talked about in the past, if you're you're going to international exchanges, you can sign up anonymously for a lot of these. But as they are monitoring and tracking them, meaning the intelligence agencies of the world, they are seeing essentially how these transactions are hopping. So that couple that I mentioned, that married couple, as they were moving from Bitcoin to Ethereum to Monero and all these other places, the intelligence, because they were monitoring all of these blockchains live at once, could literally see these transactions hopping. Not to mention, if you're going from exchange to exchange, you're outputting logging, you're outputting metadata for these exchanges, and these exchanges typically fall under the laws of the country that they're in. So if you're sitting here in the United States and you're using a US, uh, US-based currency, uh, cryptocurrency platform, let's say Coinbase, for example, which I believe is based here in the United States. San Francisco, in order. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in order to move cryptocurrency, I have to give them information. And now I have to give them a driver's license. Now I have to prove that I am who I am, which means transactionally, they're working very similar to US Bank or Chase Bank. And a lot of countries have now started to employ laws for their respective currency um, or their platforms that are sitting in their countries. And so now we are starting to see a structure kind of similar to international banking, but still has the ability to have a little bit of anonymity. But that outputted metadata, that outputted logging, if subpoenaed, can literally show any any law enforcement agency that you've been trying to launder money or move money around the world. And that's something that that I think the criminals of the world are now taking note of, which is why there's a premium when you are when you are using a common currency like Bitcoin or Ethereum, as opposed to one that is designed to obfuscate its paper trail or right. its electronic paper trail like Monero. Right. So if I had a ten thousand dollar ransom, it would be eleven thousand five hundred in Bitcoin or ten thousand in Monero. But even then the tracking in Monero is starting to get better as well. Rob, perfect. Now, Nick, how can people find out more information about you? Oh, well, I'm I'm here periodically, so make sure to listen to Tech Time. That's right. You can, also, right. You can also find me uh, on Twitter at Nick AESP, or feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn at slash Nick Espinoza. All right. Thank you very much for joining the show today. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. All right. We appreciate Nick Espinoza joining the show. Up next, we have our This Week in Technology. So this would be a great time to enjoy a little whiskey on the side. You're listening to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. See you in a few minutes. Hello, my name is Arthur, and my life's work is connecting people with coffee. Story Coffee is a small batch specialty coffee company that uses technology to connect people to each product resource, which allows farmers to unlock their economic freedom. Try our medium roast founder series coffee, which is an exotic bourbon variety that is smooth, fresh, and elegant at storycoffee.com. That's S-T-O-R-I coffee.com. Today, you can get your first bag free when you subscribe at storycoffee.com with code TECHTIME. That's S-T-O-R-I coffee.com. And now, let's look back at this week in technology. All right, we're looking at May 19th, 2001. Apple Computer opens the very first two locations of their retail stores in McLean, Virginia and Washington, D.C. In the first weekend of opening, the stores attracted 7,700 shoppers and sold a combined almost $600,000 in inventory. While ridiculed by many technology experts at the time, the choice turned out to be really wise. In Virginia, some 500 people lined up at the pre-dawn hours of the morning for a chance to be the earliest inside the first Apple retail store open to the public. The queue of Apple diehards grew throughout the day until it reached over 1,000 people. Security guards were on hand to make sure the line did not violate fire codes and registered the maximum occupancy for this building. The doors of the Virginia store opened around 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 
And history tells us that a man named Chris Barlick, who was a contributor and writer to Macworld, was one of the first customers inside. He had been waiting more than six hours for the opportunity to spend money on an Apple product. Inside, he found a spotless, well-lit space decorated with light wood, brushed steel, and crystal white glass. Apple had laid out its product colorfully by IMAX, PowerMax, and among them on the wall length at the back, some of their uh, voice recognition processes that were no longer uh, able to be purchased. There was the two that opened up on this day in 2001, but many stores have since opened. This Week in Technology, have you ever wanted to learn more history about Tech Time Radio? Well, with two hours of video, you can visit techtimeradio.com to watch our older shows or sign up for our newsletter and subscribe to the best technical information and be a part of the Tech Timers Facebook group to talk with us. We're going to take a commercial break. When we return, we have our Ask the Expert segment with guest Phil Hennessy. Hey, Mike, did you know that Unidragon puzzles are a great relaxation? Yes, I did. The 21st century widespread digitalization pushes people to have gadget-free rest. In this case, puzzles become a convenient and actual way of having rest. Yeah, they're a great way to relax. They give your brain a reboot. Is Make sure that you visit Unidragon.com with the discount code for 10% off with the code TIME10. That's T-I-M-E, the number 10, for all of our Tech Time fans across the nation. Do you know that puzzles are relatively simple tools that solve a complex range of problems? In game form, we learn useful, analytical, and communicative skills that will find the application in work, study, and other spheres of life. Yeah, they are great forms of relaxation and revitalization. Do you know that Unidragon's collections now have dinosaurs? Oh, that's my that's that's one of my favorite things. You got to make sure you keep the promo code. It's time ten because all of our audience across the nation can use time ten to receive a ten percent discount at Unidragon. That's Unidragon.com. Don't be fooled by other imitation puzzle makers. Visit Unidragon.com, the only spot for your true thinking puzzles and now for marks brought to us by story coffee visit storycoffee.com all right mike what does mark have to say all right well this is the elijah craig toasted barrel bourbon 94 proof 55 dollars a bundle this is what he got uh, Heaven Hills Birmingham Distillery is the world's largest independent family-owned bourbon distillery, which produces 1,300 barrels a day. The original distillery was built on an acreage of bar stones owned by the man named William Heavenville. The story is how Mr. Heaven Hill's name was divided into the current forms that comes down to a typographical error made on paperwork sent to the state's officials in Frankfurt. When told it would cost $10 to return to the name Heaven Hill, it was deemed unnecessary and the misspelling remained. Well, this bourbon will not be for everyone. Tasted barrel finish brings a less dry oakiness and more caramel and vanilla sweet notes. If you're seeking a bourbon with some additional character at a lower proof, this is for you. Hint, hint, Nathan. I guess it's the lower proof or was it the lower (laughs) cost? Uh, If you are more like me... Save your money for the Elijah Craig barrel proof batches. And I'll tell Mark he's wrong. This is exactly the type of whiskey that I like. It's yeah. got that taste. It's smooth. A little bit of some are taste. You, are, you pre, are you pre-thumbing up? I'm not going to pre-thumb up, but <laughs> okay. absolutely, Mark, uh, this is the best whiskey you've given us over the last three or four that we've had. So, okay. All right. Well, moving right back. Welcome back to Tech Time. I'm your host, Nathan Mum. we got Mike Day here. Um, my lie to be expert. We are getting ready now to bring on a special guest that is going to be talking about a four part series. So let's get ready to start. Welcome to the segment we call Ask the Experts with our Tech Time Radio expert, Phil Hennessy. All right, Phil, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Okay, so let's talk about this. So we're going to be doing a four-part series. It's called Ask the Experts segment, Phil's Electric versus Gas Vehicle Technology Insights. Now, this is going to be our questions that we're going to ask a lot of different questions, but really what we're trying to take a look at is an electric vehicle or 
as they known in the industry as EV. Is it sustainable to purchase one of these vehicles for your total cost of ownership now? Is it to have one later? Um, is it better to have an electric vehicle versus a gas vehicle because it saves on emissions? We're going to ask Phil all this information because he has all of this ready to go. So I'm so excited to get right into it. So let's first start out. Motorists sit stranded on Interstate 95 Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. The East Coast primary north and south highway corridor came to a complete standstill just south of Washington, D.C. Hundreds of drivers sat trapped in their cars for over 24 hours waiting for tow trucks to clear away a serious accident. Did the standstill prove that America isn't ready for electrical vehicles? Many assumed that the EVs would run out of stored electricity long before the gasoline-powered cars would run out of gas. If so, this would create medical risks for their drivers and passengers in extreme cold. Even if drivers made it out safely, they may need a tow and possibly have to go to a far away charging station when the crisis ended. We will get the answer if EV vehicles made the 24 hours later in this uh, uh, question and answer session. So, Phil, welcome again. All right. My first question to you. Explain to me the whole market. How many electric vehicles were sold last year in 2021? This was a real surprise to me. Uh, right now, the uh, for the total in 2021 is 6.5 million. Uh, however, 3.2 million of those was in China, and 535,000 of those were in the United States. So, really, a huge disparity already between uh, the U.S. and uh, and other countries. In other countries, so the U.S. still is sort of backed away from this idea. Sounds like. I I don't I don't I think I think we're much more leery, right? I'd say Europe is probably a little bit more aggressive on on on, on this process than I'd say the United States. Would you say that's a fair assessment, Phil? Yeah, Europe Europe for electric cars is around two point three million. I just didn't um, not sure what their gas cars were for last year in petrol, but their electric cars actually they've sold more electric cars in Europe than they did on diesel, which is highly unusual because diesel is a large part of their their uh, fuel source. All right, so how many? Gas vehicles were sold in 2021. So globally, again, 66.1 million. Okay. Um, in China, there were 17 million gas cars. And in uh, the U.S., there was 15 million uh, wow. gas cars. That's cars, sedans, and light vehicles and trucks. Wow. So that yeah, is... Well, part of, the, part of this is just because we are routine. We like routine. So, so the, the whole idea of an the whole EV, idea electrical change, vehicle... Is change a, is hard a, for us. Okay. Well... I would say too is that uh, one word that kept popping up is there's been a lot of uh, range, what they call range anxiety. Can we get there and can I get charged? There's some things we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. That right. sounds great. All right. Who is the leader right now in electric vehicles? Well, you guys have been talking about them trying to buy Twitter and, and all that already <laughs> this week. So, and I think we talked about space a couple months ago. Yep. So, robots, guy, and... robots, mind control, good yeah. old Elon Musk and Tesla. <laughs> That's right. Mind Elon control. Musk and Tesla. Yeah, Tesla. All right. So, why is Tesla so far ahead of everybody else? Uh, Really, they um, he did the research right in terms of battery technology first. We're going to talk about range in a little bit, and we're going to be really surprised at what his competitors are compared to he uh, where uh, Tesla is in range, okay. as well as they have the self-driving car technology, and they have a large charging network. So he was understood that, we talked about with range anxiety. You need to have a large charging network so people can charge your vehicles when they're on the road or otherwise it's tied to the house. Right. All right. So, okay. So now what's the difference? Let's explain this for everyday common person, including myself. What's the difference between an EV, an electric vehicle, a hybrid, and a hybrid plug-in vehicle? So electric car. Easy is uh, remember your old battery controlled remote controlled cars or or a fan that has a battery and a motor. Okay. It's as simple as a battery in a car with an electric motor that pushes or pulls that vehicle and it has no emissions. And so you need to plug that in into a charger to have electricity put into the battery. So then I can from that battery drive electricity to the motor to drive the car. Very simple. Uh, and a hybrid car. Uh, basically you have an electric motor on the same transmission as a gas motor. Okay. And so either the ga the electric motor then has a battery, which is then, uh, which is then charged by the car running and regenerative brakes and other things. So it's kind of a, a, a little bit, it gives a you push a push and a pull. 
a push and a pull yeah. and that uh and that motor then assists it doesn't necessarily drive the car some do some don't or it just assists the assists the gas motor is what happens there so you need gasoline and you will have emissions you but your mt your miles per gallon will be a lot higher okay, and what's a hybrid plug-in vehicle explain that to us so this is where the battery itself is charged externally gives you more range than the hybrid and actually you can drive the first uh 30 to 50 miles on the electric only and it's acts as an ev and you don't use gas at all so there's that range anxiety again the plug-in hybrid gives you that extra range too because you can put gasoline and so you can either charge it or you can fill it with gas so it's a dual purpose car oh. well yeah when i sold cars the chevy volt had come out and that that has an, a unique system where it, it uses the battery first and then it switches over to the gas engine okay okay well, right. that makes sense all right, so next question. Interstate 95, the East Coast primary north and south highway corridor, had a complete standstill. As a result, hundreds of drivers sat trapped in their cars for 24 hours. What happened to drivers stuck in an electric vehicle for 24 hours? They didn't freeze. Explain that to us. Yes, absolutely. So it turns out that uh, uh, our electric vehicles, the battery is so large that the heat draw for the heater is so small that it didn't it didn't matter if they were there for 24 hours, they would still have a heat draw and still have enough if they were fully charged when they started that trip uh, to drive and get somewhere to a charger. Uh, actual Tesla vehicles that were on the road at that time were stuck on what they call idle for for over 14 hours. And they had enough heat uh, the whole entire time to keep them warm. And they were able to drive then to the local charger after that and then drive on from there. Uh, and the other side of that is we, I did a little bit of more research and we found a guy in Norway uh, on a YouTube channel that did a research with his Tesla 3. He let it on, left it on idle, idle for, with the heat on for 70 hours. And then it, finally the car went dead and couldn't drive. But the car sat on idle with the heat for seventy hours before the car went dead. Wow. wow. What about the what about the smaller charge vehicles? Um, all of them will be about the will have some type of long term heating capability or air conditioning capability because the battery is so large compared to the draw and the other things because the motor draw is so large. So as long as you're decently charged, um, my assumption is that you're going to be okay in a in a, in a traffic accident and stuck out there in traffic for a while. So let's, let's piggyback on that, what Mike was saying. What's the mileage or hour range on a standard battery charge for an electric vehicle? So, yeah, this is where we're talking about the difference between Tesla and why Tesla's better. So okay. a, a non-Tesla EV in 2012 was about, the range was about 75 miles. And now, uh, just last year in 2021, it's 225 miles. So from wow. 2012 to 2021, they went from 75 to 225. Wow. Now, Tesla, yeah. all right, Tesla went from 265 in 2012 yeah. to 326. Wow. And then a typical gasoline car will get you 395 miles. Oh, there you go. So, so Musk is there, man. I mean, he's crazy. Yeah. Oh, he's, that, he, he's figured out how to, how to make those batteries. Well, last. that was yeah, that was one of the <laughs> when I first <laughs> when I first got to Seattle and started seeing all these little electric cars. I, I saw a lot on the side of the road. Yeah, he's road did. waiting for the tow truck. All right, last question, and then we're gonna have to leave. What is the difference in charging if the weather is really, really cold or really, really hot? Is there a difference in that? Does it does that make a well, difference? I, well, the battery will reduce range. So we just talked about, you know, the car will last and you will be safe with heat or air conditioning is too hot or too cold. However, the caveat is, is that if you're operating normally and you're in either high, very hot temperature above 95 F or you're very cold below 20 F, you're going to see a 17 to 40% reduction in uh, range by battery power. That's why Pacific so, Northwest is so popular because right. we're just a mild temperature climate. Is that, is yeah. that why? No, I don't know. I, I thought know. we were just effed. <laughs> no, no, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, Phil, we got three more parts, right? So this is part one. Yeah. Next week, our challenge is to charge or not to charge. That's what we're going to be talking about. All right. Thank you so That's much great. for being a part of this. We are excited to have you back next week, and we'll continue this discussion. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye, Bye. Phil. All Bye. right. Bye. So now's a great time to sit back, raise a glass. You're listening to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. We'll see you after the commercial break. How to see a man about a dog. 
It combines darkly comic short stories, powerful poems, and pulp fiction prose to create a heartbreaking and hilarious journey readers will not soon forget. Read How to See a Man About a Dog, Collected Writings, for free with Kindle Unlimited. Ebook available on Kindle, print copies available on Amazon the Book Depository, and more. This is Mike's Mesmerizing Moment, presented by Story Coffee. Visit storycoffee.com. All right, Mike, here's a question for you. What's my, what, what, what? So I, I know this has been bugging you, and you've been talking about this at all our production meetings. Mm-hmm. Explain to me, should a society have social robots? What is your take on social robots? <laughs> <laughs> And words my, that we can air on the yeah, radio. My my problem my problem here is that why why are we trying to use technology to solve social problems? Okay, right. We're trying to use technology to solve problems that can be solved with with human beings. All right. The problem is it's not that it's not that this is not an a, an idea that may be worth looking at, but this goes higher than than. The technology level. This is about culture. Okay. Right. So we had this. We had this thing about the assist, assisted facilities using these things. The Mindy robot. Two episodes back. Yeah. Right? Yep. That in and of itself is not is not a horrible idea, except for the fact that it's being used to cr- solve a problem that can be solved otherwise. And how could it be solved otherwise? Well, f- well, first, socialization is a human trait. And culturally, we have a problem with the elderly. So we put them in these places and we hire people to take care of them. Okay. Right? So we we kind of put it out of our minds that we need to socialize with them. And then we find out that they're not being socialized. So why do we come up with it? Again, this is a difficult question because I love I, I I love technology, but when when it comes to technology and interacting with human behavior, there's often these very severe side effects. Okay, right. So one of the things that I think is this this social robot thing is is that it, it's it's great. It's a great sort of introduction to something, right? It's there's there's this um, oh wow something new, but once once the newness wears off they just go they just slip back into the into the isolation that comes with depression and so you know the problem the problem is not something that technology can solve it's 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 something that's like this little band-aid that we we use instead of facing the real problem which is a cultural idea idea about how we should be treated create or how we should be treating elderly okay so that's 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 my big issue with that that's your big issue with that all right well i think now we're going to go to our pick of the day whiskey tasting no way yes and now our pick of the day for our whiskey tastings let's see what bubbles to the top we even we even got the music today yeah we're 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 right on time we're right on time we, we got it dialed in yeah All right, so this is um, probably some of the best whiskey I've had in a long time. This is the (laughs) Eliza Craig Toasted Barrel Bourbon, 94 proof, $55. I am going to buy bottles of this, not one but two. Remember when Screwball came out? Yeah, you were supposed to give me a bottle, but you never did. I I got like six of them at home still, so I still need to get you one of those. All right, (laughs) so this is uh, 94 proof. It has, it's got... Black pepper. It's got cocoa. It tastes like just honey. I mean, this is the best thing without a, a super taste. I'm giving it absolutely thumbs up. Yeah, absolutely thumbs up. Okay. And Mike, what are you going to do? I am going to give it a thumbs up because this is actually really good. It's really good. I am really enjoying this. Yep. It's very tasty and it's smooth without a a large bite. A, that all right, takes away the taste. Odie, you got to taste it. Also, what did you think? I really liked it. A thumbs up. Thumbs up. So that is like a three thumbs up. Yeah. You know, Mark. Well, we could give it a six thumbs up. We could. Well, we well we could. That would have been. Well, I don't know if it's. 
I don't know if it's better than Screwball, but this is top shelf. Well, this is this is this is real bourbon. This Correct. is untouched. This it's, is so it's not from, flavored. It's not so a Crown from, Royal. From or anything a like flavored that at all. whiskey perspective, yeah, this is better. All right, Mike. Well, we're about out of time. We want to thank our listening audience and hope you enjoyed our show today. You can always visit us at TechTimeRadio.com or be a caller and ask a question on the show. You could be the next star of the show by clicking on the Ask a Question on our website. All right. You can always stay connected by signing up for our newsletter and technology so that you can enter in to win some very cool prizes. What kind of prizes? Well, we, we give away Story Coffee. We give it away some other. We gave away the Vivomi Pulse device. Right now, currently, our giveaway is the Story Coffee baggie. One free bag of Story Coffee, which is worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for really? great tasting coffee. Really? Hundred thousand well, dollars, huh? In my opinion, at least okay, it's a very Elon. decent part. Okay, all right. Now, from all of us at Tech Time, I'm honored to be the host of today's show. I wish you a great week. And remember, the science of tomorrow starts with the technology of today. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us on Tech Time Radio. We hope that you had a chance to have that hmm moment today in technology. The fun doesn't stop there. We recommend that you go to techtimeradio.com and join our fan list for the most important aspect of staying connected and winning some really great monthly prizes. We also have a few other ways to stay connected, including subscribing to our podcast on any podcast service from Apple to Google and everything in between. We're also on YouTube, so check us out on youtube.com slash techtimeradio, all one word. We hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did making it for you. From all of us at Tech Time Radio, remember, mum's the word. Have a safe and fantastic week.